<laughs> Love it. What do you call that one? It's called Waco Wasted, bro. I remember when I first heard about Area 51, I thought it was a complete joke. I did not think anyone would be dumb enough to storm Area 51. So we were talking about how funny it's gonna be and how all these people are gonna you know, end up in jail because they're trying to storm Area 51. Well, it began as a joke, but now it's turned into something much more serious and Nevada is trying to get ahead of the Storm Area 51 event. A U.S. town in Nevada near Area 51 is bracing for an invasion by alien hunters. Even if a fraction of the three million who have rsvp for this event show up, you have a traffic, cell phone, sanitation, and public safety nightmare in an area with basically one two-lane highway. More than two million Facebook users have RSVP'd. Alien, it didn't start off as alien stock. It started off as this whole raid Area 51 joke, right? Yeah. And then probably only like two or three weeks ago did they come up with the idea of let's actually do something fun, right? So we're talking in a month and a half turnaround, they can pull this off in the middle of nowhere in the desert in Nevada. With no money. With no, like, who's involved with this that's ever done a festival? Like this, no offense to the guy who organized everything, but it looks like he lives in his mom's basement wearing Slayer hats and Slayer t-shirts and Naruto headbands, you know? Like, is that the person that's gonna pull together an entire festival? They have to pull it off though. I mean, the whole world's watching. It's true. I think you're probably right on the money. I think it's gonna be a, a giant camping site. A bunch of kids sleeping in cars, smelling like BO and- uh, Something good stuck. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be- Sounds like a regular. It's gonna be an experience regardless, so. As the weeks went by, I realized like, yes, it was a joke, but there was a lot of people taking this thing seriously. And I knew in that moment, this was something we had to be part of. If people were gonna show up, if people were going to do this, that story deserved to be told. And we were in a great position to tell that story. So I think it was in that moment we decided we're making this happen. We are going to be part of Storm Area 51. They can't stop us all. Clap the alien cheeks. Clap those cheeks. <laughs> when I first heard about the raid of Area 51, it was kind of piqued my interest. It was a story that I thought, wow, that'd be cool to go down there and tell that story. Whenever there's a project that you don't want to tell your parents about, you know it's a good project, and this was one of those. And I avoided telling them all the way up until I think it was a few days before we left. But yeah, I was always interested in Area 51 and in space. My, my dad worked on the Apollo program back in the 60s and 70s. And hearing him talk about that experience just really gave me an interest in space travel and technology and aliens and, and those things. And so when this story came up, it was, it was something that I really wanted to be a part of. The idea that the government is hiding advanced alien technology, that's, that's a fun idea. You know, it's a ridiculous idea to think that anyone was going to be able to raid Area 51 and find those secrets out. Uh, but, but yeah, the, the draw for me as a filmmaker is, is telling the story of what actually was going to happen, seeing, seeing who shows up to Area 51 and who, who maybe tries to raid the gates. When Tyler first mentioned that he wanted to go to Area 51, I was already 150% on board. My dad, being the bass player in 90s alt-rock band Dishwalla, introduced me to music all the time. There's always music playing in our house. And I was raised on Joni Mitchell, Jefferson Airplane, The Zombies, Bob Dylan, Donovan, all that good stuff. And I never had my Woodstock. My entire life, I, I wish I had been there for Woodstock. And this is my opportunity. Ever since we found out that there was gonna be this music festival at Area 51. Uh, after that, what ensued was uh, just a roller coaster of it's gonna happen, it's not gonna happen, it's canceled, it's back on again. And the entire time we're just riding it wondering, is this gonna happen at all? Was all that work we put into this up until this point for naught? Was it, was it all a waste of our time? And it kind of felt like it in that moment. Everything we were hearing out of Rachel was that they were still gonna have a music festival. Uh, but of course, there was this other side of it, this this grassroots 
raid of Area 51, and, and it was impossible to predict who was gonna show up. Was it gonna be a bunch of these uh, crazy alien conspiracy theorists that were gonna come and actually try to storm the gates? We didn't know. Pam, nice to meet you. My name's Tyler. And pa Pam, can I just ask you just a couple quick questions just kind of on your opinion on what's going on? Is that the event is going to be going on. Okay. Um, and there's going to be live music. There will be some vendors and... That's all I can tell you, sweetie. I don't really know. Okay, so but the event is definitely still on because I mean we've heard mixed oh, messages yeah, that it's canceled and and things like that. So yeah, no, our photo parties will be showing up today. The medics were just here to uh, find their spot. Sundance helicopters will be here. So perfect. So it sounds like it's a go. Oh yes, absolutely. I think deep down we knew something was going to happen. We just didn't know what that something was. The morning that we left, I, I had a big breakfast, my last home-cooked meal before we left, and uh, kissed my wife goodbye, and yeah, that was it. The anxiety was very present in all of us before leaving. We didn't know if this was a good decision, um, if this video was gonna turn out, if this event was gonna be a total disaster. We didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. We were secretly nervous sick about it, but none of us were saying anything. So we're in the middle of Utah right now, just driving. We are heading to St. George, where we're gonna be staying the night. Tomorrow we're gonna go pick up the RV in Las Vegas and head out to Rachel. Uh, I just don't think it's gonna be super organized. Like, I'm, I'm scrolling through the Facebook page right now. People are trying to meet up, throw some stuff together. We're like four days away from the event and no one really knows what we're doing yet. I don't know if there's gonna be anything out there when we show up. I think anytime you head off into the unknown, it can be unsettling, but it's also exciting and that's what makes life worth living. We were about three hours out and we hit this massive traffic jam. This was only Tuesday. The event was supposed to be on Friday and there were already hundreds of cars lining this road and none of them were moving. We come to a complete stop and we sit there for a good 10 minutes or so. So there's a car that's completely just on fire, just engulfed in flames. A car just lit on fire right in the middle of the road, pulled off and everyone had to stop. As we're seeing that, it just made me realize like we were in the wild west. Like there's just, there's nothing out there. They had to wait for 30, 45 minutes for a fire truck to show up to put out this car. Everyone was just stuck there with nothing to do and nowhere to go. And it was almost like, is this, is this foreshadowing what's to come later in the week? Um, it kind of made us nervous, honestly, to see that and to see how little resources were out there in the middle of the desert. And one little problem, like a car lighting on fire, caused that much commotion. It's like, what happens when millions of people are out here? They don't have anything to drink. They don't have anything to eat. They run out of gas. Is this just going to be complete chaos? It was a sense of excitement. It was a sense of fear, the sense of not knowing what could or couldn't happen, the sense of not wanting to fail. The feeling that trumped all the other feelings was that feeling of excitement. Over the years, I've had the chance to travel all over the world, but there was nothing like uh, arriving that first night in Rachel, Nevada.
When we got to Rachel, we didn't really realize until we really got there and we're standing outside that this is in the middle of nowhere. 100% desert in all directions, except for this tiny little restaurant slash bar. It, it almost didn't make any sense. It was the strangest thing. And we just got this feeling of like, in the middle of the ocean, there's nothing out here. Barely any people even. When you look up and you, you see the sky, completely not a millimeter empty, just full of stars. It's completely breathtaking and awe-inspiring. We are so microscopically small that we are literally insignificant in this vastness of space that we're in. The group of people that were gathered in Rachel that evening were just some of the most interesting people I think I've ever met. I'm not a woo-woo guy, I'm not a new agey guy, I'm not into chakras and crystals, but there's an energy here. Um, that's the best way I can describe it. And I feel it, I can actually physically feel it every time I go over the second uh, ridge over there. Other people have felt it too. Literally, other people have felt it too. I've had many person after person after person say they felt it too. There is an energy here. And that's what Rachel means to me. I think that uh, certain people have a uh, internal antenna, like an internal uh, frequency that um, they can be in certain places and it gets tickled by something. You know, volcanic activity, gravity, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, but whatever it is about this place, it tickles me. Whatever it is about the base, Area 51, it tickles me. It keeps drawing me here. That's the magic of this place. First time I come here, I come here in the morning, and one of the people here, I'm not going to say who, was really surly and, and short with me, and meh, 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 early in the morning. Immediately, they pegged me. They saw, oh, that's one of them. And by the second morning here, you get your own damn coffee, your family. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So, Nathan, what do you do out here? So, man, I sit there. Um, I sit in my chair, I spark up a cigarette or something else, I wait five minutes and away we go. I could be inside of an abandoned mine, I could be inside of a canyon right over there, I could be um, in a valley right over there, I could be on Fort Sims right up there, you know, I could be on a dry lake bed right there, There's stuff all over the place, you just gotta know how to get to it. There's uh, more to Area 51 than the back gate. That's Rachel. That's Rachel Nevada. My name is Unicol Unicron. I'm a pop star cult leader. I'm actually um, alien consciousness born into a human body. So I'm highly connected to um, a certain group of aliens called Arcturians. And many of my friends are similarly connected to different alien races. We came here um, to Area 51 to call for disclosure for uh, the truth to be told about aliens, about other things. We all know the government lies to us and I think it's really frustrating for all of us. I really love the spirit of this event, which is lighthearted and not angry necessarily. Me and my cult are here, we're doing classes, we're teaching telepathy, we're going on UFO hunting excursions and um, we've seen some amazing stuff. Naturally, I joined in. I don't know if it was the trippy Moog music or the incense or what, but I got this ethereal feeling, um, just something I hadn't felt before. I saw two orbs that were orbiting each other. One was magenta, one was green, uh, made up of some sort of like, almost like TV static, just vibrating together, like molecules. And as they orbited around each other, I went straight down and I landed in a green space surrounded by these buzzing atoms. And it was at that moment that she asked us each to communicate with our astral guide. And at that point I realized I didn't have an astral guide with me. I was alone in what seemed to be just a mess of li lifeless static. But even still, it was an incredible experience, something that I didn't know existed. Gabe, good for you. 
So for me, it's like a really deep topic because I connect deeply to aliens and yeah, I know they're real. I believe that they're interdimensional beings, so it's not always as like much as like, oh, you just saw them like as a person, like they came in a spaceship physically, like these are light ships that we're talking about. This is technology beyond what we can even imagine. And the beings themselves have the ability to be outside of time, be outside of space. So it's, it's outside of what we really expect. 1984 in Wisconsin, I encountered a UFO, maybe 50 feet above me, and I was under it, and it made no noise. It was as big as a, uh, an airplane. It had millions of lights, and they flashed down on the ground, and I was underneath it. Not knowing, never believing in UFOs, thinking it's sci-fi, you know, not a real thing, but it's a real thing. I personally, uh, um, only as tall as the tree right there, right up above me. And the, the lights flashed. I don't know if I was abducted, but about two years ago, I met a woman that had been abducted since she was a little girl, and I told her the story, and she said, you absolutely were. And I, I know they're here, and I know that we study them, and it's not a bad thing, but it is, humanity isn't ready yet. That's why. They're not telling us. And there's many species, but I think I only know of two. Um, <laughs> and that's the tall grays and the centurions. Um, there are other species, and they got reptilians, but I've never, and I believe, by, by, they're from other planets. I don't know. I'd love to say I want to meet that species as well. To believe that we are the only ones doesn't make any sense. So people who have the same mentality as I do and as my friends do, that there has to be other life out there, uh, is exciting to be able to openly communicate with other people about my beliefs and not get criticized for it is, is going to be and has been an amazing thing. Area 51 is in my backyard. Do I believe that there's something other than an airplane or a helicopter or a drone? I saw a flying saucer. I saw orbs after that. Um, did I go into a spaceship? No. Did I lose some time? Absolutely. How much time? I don't know. Do I see things? We have an amazing sky. It's absolutely amazing. I, I can't describe it. I just call them dancing stars, and they do have a beautiful picture at night, all night, all night long. To think that we're the only people in the universe would be foolish. I've been to Griffith Park Observatory. I go there quite often when I'm in Los Angeles, and downstairs um, they have a wall where they've taken a, a little slice of the sky, a very little slice of the sky, and they've blown it up to this huge wall so you can see all the stars that are out there. And there's all these planets surrounding all those stars. And it was just a small little sliver of the sky, and there was a millions of stars. And to, to imagine the rest of the sky is filled with all these billions of planets and stars and we're the only intelligent life would be foolish to think that way. Whether they have aliens back over that hill, they know, um, and you know, maybe someday we'll find out if it's true or not. Uh, one time years ago, uh, I was laying in a park in Seattle, it was a Sunday afternoon, three through in the afternoon, and I was laying, looking up at the sky, and I just happened to catch something moving from south to north, and there were four objects, and they were kind of boxy shape with these little side things on them, and they were in a formation just moving alongside. I wrote them off as satellites. I hope it's something else. Wouldn't that be great? They probably think we're nuts. Well, I think one of the most interesting things is that you remember a few years back and stuff, they had that big scare in Phoenix, the lights over Phoenix and stuff like that. And we just laugh because we see this stuff on TV. We see that this out here two or three times a month, same exact stuff. 
And all it is is just the Air Force. I mean, you'll see big lights glowing in the sky and look like they're motionless and stuff, and they've got flares. And they do war games out here all the time, and so we get to see all of that stuff. As for do I believe that aliens are out there? No, I don't. I've lived here for since the 70s. <laughs> Haven't seen one yet. Before alien stock, before the music, before all of that nonsense, it was all about the raid. Raiding Area 51, breaking in, and stealing some aliens. There's something about the Twitter age and the social media age and the Facebook age that is just a uh, 20 teens phenomena of uh, just a lone person in their basement just doing a joke and then it makes worldwide news. It's time for it to go viral, you know? Why not Storm Area 51? It just seems like it's time. It's just, it was time for that to go viral. If it wasn't him, it would have been somebody else. There's always been the mystery of what's going on over there. Right? I mean, I think Rachel Nevada, I don't think would exist today. The, the mine shut down. There used to be 200 people here, now there's 54 people here. And the only reason why there's 54 people here is because of the mystery. And it was the mystery of what's over there. And maybe we can get in there. And if we all get together and do it, we'll find something. But you know, even if 10,000 people made it to the base, how are they gonna get through the locked door? You're not gonna get in with a crowbar. When I first heard of them doing this Storm Area 51 event, I honestly thought that there was a bunch of idiots that would actually try to do it. We've got a lot of people that work here, and in order to even get out there to work, it usually takes them up to two years of background checks and waiting before they can even get approved to go out onto the base at all. So, yeah, they're not going to let anybody out there. <laughs> We just want to drive up by the gates and see it. Um, we're not here for trouble, we're here for oh, fun. Oh, exactly. <laughs> so, but we do, we came all this way from Wisconsin, we have to go to the gates. There's a high risk in this whole situation. I mean, two million people said that they're going to storm a military base and free aliens. They could jam all of our signals, they could microwave our bodies. Like, the horrific nature of the reality of the government is that they are very powerful and we are very weak in this particular situation technologically. As Friday progressed and it started getting later towards the night, there was a lot of chatter about people meeting up at 3 a.m. and actually going up to the gate. And I was like, is this seriously gonna happen? Are people really going to do this? We're going through the gate. We're going out towards the gate. <laughs> no. Been there, done that. <laughs> You're not going to do that? No, there, oh, we got to go. I woke up and I had this internal dilemma. I was like, I am so freaking tired right now. It had been a long week up until this point. We'd been shooting all day, every day. Is this really worth it? Do we really need to go out there? Mark and Gabe are snoring off in the distance. Like it just, I didn't know if we really wanted to do it. So I sat, I remember I sat in bed for maybe a good five to 10 minutes, just debating whether we should actually go out there or not. Are we actually going to do this? Are we actually going to drive up to the gates of Area 51 right now? Everyone here had come to Area 51 with this in mind, but now that it came down to it, no one was sure. So Mark almost talked us out of going, like, ooh, I have a wife and kids. I guess I have a wife too, but I'm bad at gauging risks, I guess. I just don't want to spend a night in jail. But we are seriously going to regret not going. And I knew we had to go. And in that moment, I decided I was going to wake Mark and Gabe up, drag him out of bed, do whatever it took. But we were going and we were going to see if anyone actually stormed Area 51. There was this building tension and excitement as we approached uh, Rachel again to see who was gonna be there for the raid. And there were more people in that parking lot than I had seen all week. And up the dirt path going towards Area 51, there was so many vehicles driving up towards Area 51. People are actually going to do this. We're from Utah. St. George, Utah. 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 Yeah. 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 And we're going to Area 51. We're, we're just to, uh, here to check it out. We're just so, gonna see what's happening. This is yeah. history being we, made. We, Mom, like if I don't snow. come home, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, for real. Yeah, my mom, mom, I love you. If I don't make it back, and I'm sorry. You I'm raised the dumb bitch. Yeah. I'm here to see some people run across the gate, but I don't know if that's gonna happen. You never know. Are you here to run No, I work tomorrow. <laughs> I have a job and a life.
just want to check it out, you know, so we can see any aliens. We're going to go out there, see far, how far we can get, so we can see anything. Do you plan to go past the gate? You just going to Maybe. Wait, what are you depends doing? when we get there. It all depends on who's there when we get to the gate. Okay. See how serious they are. <laughs> Gotta get an ET out of there, man. The government wants you to believe he's back home, but he's not. Yeah, we ain't no joke. We out there. You guys sitting out right now? Yep. yep. We're gonna save these aliens. It's about time. We're gonna clap these alien cheeks. All right? Mark my <laughs> words. After probably the most exhausting day of my life, I remember having this dream. We were all together in the truck and we were singing Green Sleeves. And it was beautiful. I mean, this is a once in a lifetime experience and it was so surreal. You're in a car with two guys in the middle of the night driving to the gates of Area 51, Gabe suddenly says, hey, I had a dream that we were all singing Green Sleeves, which I think is a Christmas song. Like, we didn't even have to talk about it. We all just started singing Green Sleeves, and I watched my dream unfold before my very eyes. He made his dream come true, which is good, but it was just a, a surreal moment, and everybody was kind of on edge and kind of nervous about what was about to happen and what was going to transpire at the gates of Area 51, and there we were singing Green Sleeves. Okay, we're walking up to the gate of Area 51 right now. I mean, it was just hundreds of cars parked alongside the dirt road. We parked behind them. We started walking up, and it was a long walk. There's these giant spotlights out there. And we're like, what, what is going to happen when we get up to this gate? just these two bright spotlights in the middle of the night and you're just cautiously approaching and as we got closer and closer uh, you could hear kind of the party that was happening at the gate. peaceful situation and in my mind like in everyone's mind I think leading up to that event like people were gonna get shot people were gonna get arrested I mean all sorts of things were gonna happen and it just wasn't that it's just the surreal experience to be at the gates of this military base in the middle of the night with this group of people it was it was old people and young people and reporters and people dressed like aliens and, and people with signs it was almost like a protest but but just such a lighthearted uh, mood and atmosphere. Uh, the guards were, were taking pictures. I think that moment made almost that entire trip worth it, just being there for that raid of Area 51. Raiding Area 51 is something that some people will just never understand. It's really hard to describe the emotion of being there with all of this going on, being there at the gates of Area 51, where they never let anyone, but they let us. From an outsider's perspective, looking in, it would just seem like such a stupid thing. It's easy to make fun of it, but yet this, this group of people were together and experiencing something uh, that had never happened before. When we were there, we just knew if you had made it this far, you're cool. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> 
Can I touch the stick? No, I don't want it. Well, thanks guys for coming anyways. We tried. Music has an alluring force to it. And I don't think there's really anyone that understands it. I've heard a lot of people say music is the cleanest high you can get. Music takes you places that you could never visit physically. I think it's a guiding light to humanity. It's what brings us all together in the end because music can create a pure emotion that can be universal, that we can all understand and we can all feel. And when you're there at a concert or a festival and you hear that chord and you feel it, you know that everyone around you feels the exact same thing. And that's what's so powerful about something like this. There were gonna be some interesting bands there. There was gonna be Jesse Hughes from Eagles of Death Metal. There's gonna be Speed of Light. Uh, Pink Lemonade was gonna be there. And it was gonna be a really cool music festival. In the end, Jesse Hughes ended up canceling and not coming. And he was one of many artists that canceled just right before the event itself. So a lot of the artists that, that did show up ended up playing multiple sets uh, through multiple days. The artist for me that, that rocked the stage more than anyone else was a band from LA called Speed of Light. The intention when we went to Area 51 was to document, but the longer we stayed there, the more we found ourselves participating and observing less. It was, it was an energy that we just got caught up in. People ask us all the time, what was it like? Explain, talk to me about it. We were able to be part of this event, be part of this, this thing that will forever live in history, and I think that was an honor. I went into this project thinking I was gonna cover a bunch of kind of crazy people that believe in aliens. And really what we found was just an incredible community of people. And some of them have had unexplained experiences. And after hearing those experiences, uh, you know, I don't know what to believe. I think a lot of people go through life wishing they did certain things, uh, wishing they were part of certain things. And the fear of the unknown always keeps them away from doing it. There's always an excuse as to why you can't do something. And I think for me, Gabe and Mark, like we realized like, if we want to do something, go do it, make it happen. I don't know if there's going to be another event that's quite as difficult as this one was to film for us. And I think as filmmakers and just as, as human beings, we were able to overcome every obstacle that was thrown our way. We were able to say, we're going to do something and follow through. And I think that's, that's important. It helped us as professionals, but I think it also helped us as just as people. Um, and I think there's a lot we're going to take away from that. You know, when me, Gabe, and Mark get together and talk about this experience, like it's one that I think we'll forever cherish. I hope that someday I'm able to have an extraterrestrial encounter myself. That is my only hope. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I'm not taking this seriously.